Welcome everybody, it is Business Monday and it is a little overcast outside on Business Monday here at the Navigant Credit Union Broadcast Center. It's been a beautiful day so far. Megan Decker is here from G Media Studios off the wildly successful uh, blockchain summit in Rhode Island. Uh, let's talk a little bit about it. Yes, the very first blockchain summit in Rhode Island was an awesome kickoff. And uh, we had an exciting two days last week that we're really excited that you could be a part of. Yeah, it was thank great. You. Thank you very much for joining us. Um, shows that G Media is able to really throw an amazing event <laughs> to put it together was, in you a know, short it, period of time. Yeah, uh, just so people, if they didn't have a chance, it was a lot of coverage by us and by other media organizations of it, about uh, 80 to 100 of you know, top tier blockchain technologists, financiers, innovators from around the world came into Providence. Uh, some of these, you know, entrepreneurs, the founder of Vonage and Voice Over IP, you work with Jeff uh, quite a bit, and Steve, the founder of Alchemist. These are some of the smartest guys in technology in the world, and they came into Providence, and I, I think it was you know, a really good couple of days for what Rhode Island's good at. You guys were tremendous pulling it together in two weeks. Yeah. Um, give, uh, you know, boy oh boy, uh, Go Local Beats Up Commerce uh, Corporation on a regular basis, but give them, uh, give them a lot of credit. Uh, Stephen Pryor and his team, they were all there. They brought the right players to the table to have conversations about what the industry would need to move into Rhode Island. Yeah, absolutely. I think, you know, it's always exciting and, uh, and fun when you bring together the kind of folks that were in the room for this event. Right. You know, we had the governor there who's, you know, supporting this initiative. We have Jeff, as you mentioned, who's uh, the VP of Alchemist, along with Stephen, who, you know, is the founder of Alchemist and, you know, played a big part in the creation of Ethereum. So you bring in between the political side of Rhode Island, G Media, and these really smart people in the space who you know are not only um, playing in the blockchain technology space but they're investing and they're supporting this landscape to make this a really successful opportunity and they want it to be in Rhode Island and we want it to be in Rhode Island and it can it's a great opportunity to bring a huge amount of jobs here and corporations so we're excited people from around the world as you mentioned came in um, and they have the network and the support team behind them to really make this happen. So we're extremely excited. Listen, Rhode Island's not the only state that's trying to woo uh, many of the leading companies in blockchain. And, you know, blockchain is a multi-billion dollar business sector that will grow into a multi-trillion dollar business sector in the next two, three, four years. Uh, IBM has functionally repositioned their entire corporation. I was listening uh, at uh, lunch break to a couple of the entrepreneurs from Florida. They had all been wooed into Savannah, Georgia, and Savannah, Georgia, and Georgia officials put on, you know, put on the, the best, uh, rolled out the red carpet for them there. But there was, did really seem to be a connection with Rhode Island officials. Um, you know, Governor Raimondo often gets criticized for not connecting with Rhode Islanders. She sure connected in that presentation. That was her sweet spot. And uh, she, she presented for about 20 minutes and, and wowed the crowd. Yeah, I mean, people were thrilled to get the opportunity to talk with her, um, just her vision of what this can be. And it, I think it's, you know, it's just a great opportunity for startups and these established companies in blockchain or cryptocurrency to lay roots here in Rhode Island. Uh, we have the infrastructure in place. You know, we have a lot of our clients now are out in New York and in Long Island. Right. It's a quick train ride. We, you know, Boston here, we have this, you know, it's affordable, it's efficient. It's a, it's a great spot for this to happen here. Um, you know, the other interesting component of it that I thought um, made a connection between these entrepreneurs is the college, the, the, who the colleges are producing. And Rhode Island is not particularly good at retaining 
uh, their graduates. It's the second worst DMA in the country at 70% of college graduates coming out of uh, Rhode Island universities and colleges leave the marketplace. But it also shows what the opportunity is. The opportunity is that if you create a bastion of cool technology companies, uh, you can start retrain, uh, retaining those who are graduating from computer science from Brown or engineering from URI or from PC or Johnson & Wales or all these places. Um, a huge opportunity to really reinvigorate the Rhode Island economy to another level. Absolutely. Um, you guys pulled this together. You brought people in from around the world. You got the governor there, the speaker of the house, media there. You picked venues. You had them down to Newport. Um, as an and thank you for your help, by the way. <laughs> as an agency, how the heck did you do it in uh, two weeks? I didn't do it. <laughs> um, no, you're I, supposed to take credit for all the good stuff and then... I know, right? I know. Uh, I could take credit for it, but really it was definitely my, the team behind me. Yeah. So, you know, we are a, a small agency, but we're a robust team and they're smart. We worked a lot of hours. You right. know, we pulled in a lot of other stakeholders, um, you know, the Alchemist team, their support, their help. Uh, it's always nice when you have uh, a client like them where they're yeah. really around the clock working with us hand in hand and collaborating. They're beyond around the clock. Yeah, we, we, we hang yeah. out on the weekends. <laughs> yeah. I get worried if I don't have a 4 a.m. text on a Saturday. Um, but no, I mean, you know what, we appreciate that because right. I'd rather constant communication than lacking. So we all kind of dug our heels in, worked together. Um, a lot of the Rhode Island government officials were extremely supportive and helpful as well. I mean, absolute shout out to them. Um, and our network as well, it's nice being a small agency in Rhode Island and the access of our network that we're able to bring our clients and help broker these opportunities with the state and really set up something like that was really unique and different than I don't think a lot of companies can offer up. Um, the uh, success uh, certainly was those two days. How does the success of those two days turn into the long-term success? What's the follow-up? What's the connections? I know certainly one of the most important issues to the technologists who are building out this industry is what are, what's the regulatory structure? And Wyoming has been at the forefront. Um, I didn't get a wild, and I don't want to speak out of school, but I didn't get a wild success that all these guys who work out of New York and, and California and Utah and Florida and Israel and Europe and Asia want to move the entire industry to Wyoming. No disrespect to Wyoming in any way, shape, or form. But Rhode Island has an opportunity, and part of it's a regulatory structure. Mm -hmm. And what's the, what does Rhode Island need to do to kind of make this happen? Here's a chance, you know, we're the creators of the Industrial Revolution. This might be the next Industrial Revolution. Certainly has the impact of being, of what the first dot-com era and the building of the internet was for Silicon or Boston. This has kind of a similar situation of really significant opportunities for employment and uh, transforming an economy. How does Rhode Island, G Media, et cetera, take advantage of this new dialogue that we're having? Sure. So I think it's going to be really important that, well, A, I think actually a lot of the folks were very excited, obviously, about the opportunity for Providence because they, we do have the infrastructure from a transportation perspective. Right. I mean, you know me, I, I mean, even I'm not from Israel, obviously, but I commute from Connecticut, New York twice a week right. to Rhode Island, and it's easy peasy. Um, but I think we're going to have to make it very, we're going to have to continue to make the conversation enticing, the opportunity enticing to keep everybody excited and interested in doing this. But I think we've set the stage. And I think everybody's interested in continuing the conversation. The growth of this uh, technology sector is, uh, you know, moving at lightning speed. Yeah. Um, governments don't always move at lightning speed. How do we make sure that everybody understands? And I don't want to say the urgency because that gives it a false light. It's just the reality. The reality is that entire business sectors are going to transform the, how they transfer information, transfer money, leveraging a far more secure technological infrastructure, mm -hmm. i.e. blockchain. And uh, no one's waiting for it, you know, Bank of America, et cetera, et cetera. So how does that happen at the level of speed that it needs to 
so that we don't sit here a year from now going, oh, that was such a good summit, uh, darn. <laughs> Too bad Boston won again. Yeah, <laughs> right? which we obviously don't want to happen. Well, the conversations haven't stopped. Right. So that's the one good thing is, you know, this, the summit may have ended after we had some lovely lobsters <laughs> right. and, and clams, but um, the conversations have not stopped. Um, there's a lot of buzz around what happened from, from all parties. Uh, G Media, the government, and a lot of these companies. We've already been, um, we've already had a lot of the guests reach out to us. Yeah, that's right. And they're excited to hear what those next steps are. So as the uh, the conversations continue, we're excited to share them with you as they unfold. That's great. Uh, we, we enjoyed I didn't it. Answer your question. Yeah, you did a little bit. <laughs> uh, well, that the conversations continue to happen and that they are moving forward. Yeah. Um, uh, let's shift a little bit. Let's talk about how uh, the responsiveness of your agency to be able to take advantage. Uh, one thing that should be mentioned was this was private sector funded. This was not funded by Rhode Island State Government. It was funded by uh, Alchemist and, and other sponsors of the, of the, of the summit. Yes, this uh, is a thought leadership forum where to bring all of the right folks together to have some engaging, smart conversations. And, um, how do you leverage that and transfer that ability to kind of move lightning quick, be incredibly well organized, have some creativity to it, um, to other applications within communications, uh, technology, branding, public relations, and all the other spheres that you guys work in? How will we bring blockchain? In? No. How do you leverage? How do you, how do you continue the conversation about your agency success and and explain it to other business sectors to be able to take advantage of what you are able to do in blockchain? Sure. I mean, just alone from the conversations that we were able to be a part of at the summit, specifically in blockchain. Yeah. It's been very interesting. These conversations started before and after with a lot of these ICO startups and a lot of the people in this space where you have these brilliant folks that are starting up these investment companies, but from an advertising perspective, it's lacking. Yeah. So we're really supporting from a creative design and communications platform um, a better way for them to set the stage for themselves. Yep. Um, a few of them that I've seen, they we've, we've had to kind of refix and tweak because it, it's so new. Like you said, it's ever changing, and a lot of these sites are set up looking B two C. Yeah. And they're okay. supposed to be B two B, but um, we're just leveraging all the communication channels from Twitter's big in this space, yep. even though we're seeing a huge decline in yeah. Twitter, obviously. But and we'll, we'll talk social media in a moment. Mm -hmm. But that's where that's where the conversation is happening in this space, and. So from that and just really keeping a, a pulse on digital. You guys work in technology. You work in the insurance industry with one of the largest mm -hmm. uh, US insurance companies, sure. MetLife. Um, and you work in a range of different uh, segments with a, a, a number of leading brands. What are you seeing from a global standpoint of what's the change? You know, you're seeing big Boston agencies, a fraction of the size that they used to be. Same's happening in New York. You know, offices used to have 2,000 people, and now they have hundreds of people. How do you guys take advantage of that? The smaller, more nimble size, the more strate strategy. Talk about that a little bit as you build your business. Sure. I mean, especially for, for G Media specifically, you know, when I came on board, we were doing a lot of experiential engagement marketing. That was really, beca because a lot of our large um, national and global clients were, we were playing in that space. And I know you know, as I've mentioned, my background's primarily always been from the client side in brand marketing and in brand strategy coming over to the agency side as well. So working on big brands right down to little to smaller mid-sized brands, it's, I think what it comes down to is we're all looking at our marketing dollars and where we're getting the ROI and it's, it's unbundling what we bundled and unbundled again from media and creative. Like <laughs> technology is going to be the driver. Right. And that's going to end up being the driver of the creative and the media, not the creative or the media arm running it. Um, huge changes in media. Um, you know, today, uh, this morning, we announced the addition of two new hosts, a new columnist, yes. a new chief operating officer, a new reporter. Later in the day, the Providence Journal announced that four of their 
Um, you know, veteran reporters were taking a, another buyout. Uh, that reduces their staffing to, you know, a uh, number of reporters in the mid to low teens. Uh, you're seeing everything transform and how to get the message out. Uh, as an agency, how do you assess, move, where to put the money, how to move the money, et cetera? I think for us, it's really important that we're focusing on the bigger picture of what our clients are looking to do. So, you know, we get a lot of requests being a, you know, a small agency, oh, we need a video done, or oh, we need a, um, you know, a photo shoot, or, or, or something small, and for me, it's really coming back to, well, why are we doing this, or why do you, why do you want to do social, why do you want to do a PR event, because I think at the end of the day, once you start unbundling why, the reason why, it might be very, very different from what they want to achieve. Right. So it's, for me, it's looking at the brand itself, the core of where you want to be at the end of the day. So you're looking at what the business goals are and then building the strategy the around it. picture and then unfolding it to that. Well, let's go to social media in the last few minutes. Uh, we saw Facebook have a hemorrhage, really their first setback from a stock standpoint. They lost about 20% of value on Thursday lost over a hundred billion dollars in value depending on how you treat these things it was one of the biggest setbacks for a company uh, don't cry for Facebook um, the, are we the, gonna cry for Twitter? <laughs> Twitter's having another bad day um, <laughs> down another eight percent today Twitter's got bigger issues related to the business model you know one of the things that the stock market was uh, off the quarterly for the second quarter I guess for Facebook was that their rate of growth in revenue was decreasing. Not that their revenue was decreasing, but their rate of growth. And that the number of people that had used um, consistently in the last 30 days had dropped from 1.49 billion to 1.47 billion users. I don't know. Once you get over a billion users, I'm thinking your business is pretty good for the next quarter. You're, you're, you're going to be all right. You're going you're, you're to be yeah. okay at least for the next quarter. Um, Twitter's issue is different. They've had to shed a huge number of uh, Twitter followers, Twitter accounts that were that, that were bots driven. Um, we lost, I think in Providence, we have around 48,000, somewhere around there, and we lost around four or 500 of those. Uh, I was glad to see them go. We try and pick them off as they come in. They have no value to the communications. They give false numbers for everybody. Uh, it really becomes an undependable, unmeasurable, um, a tool for communications. Um, we see much greater stability as a news organization and how to get content out to folks via Facebook than we do in, in Twitter. Uh, what was your takeaway as an agency? And I know when you work in, you know, especially in media, uh, sports, entertainment, and tech, those are the, really the four base groups that use Twitter the most politics uh, as well. Uh, other s spheres of business could care less about Twitter. Uh, w w what's been the impact on your agency and your social media staff? So f from our end, from a technology standpoint, you know, it's, it's clearly important for us for however we're working with our clients that they have a trustworthy platform. Yeah. Because all of our brands, when you look at like Unilever, they will not work with any influencer marketing that has any kind of issue like this yeah. when it comes to bots and things like that. Um, you want to trust the brand that you're marketing to and marketing from. Um, we make sure that we're going through, like it's part of kind of our initial strategy and, and phased process to make sure that we kind of clean everything out before we start. So from that standpoint, from a brand presence for our, for our clients, especially ones that are using Twitter as like their major platform. So it's platform. trust, authenticity, you know. Um, uh, you know, do you get a sense of, you know, in the long term where, you know, it's hard to predict any of these things, the world moves so quickly, um, you know, from our, from our business standpoint of how we distribute content, we feel very strongly that Facebook is a good distribution structure. Mm -hmm. It allows you to micro-target. We boost our content a lot, our news stories. You know, if you've got a story about something in South County and you can tell people in South County, 
it it's makes much more efficient. Um, Google and the rest will allow search to take care of things. Uh, but it, it just absolutely dominates how information gets out and how information moves between search and uh, social media. Yeah, I don't. I mean, I don't think Facebook or Twitter are going and going away anytime soon. I think it's just the the timing and where we are. After Cambridge Analytica, Facebook, <laughs> they were they were fine, and now you're seeing like they're they're in clean, it's a little bit of cleanup mode. Yeah. And investors are nervous and they're scared, but you have to. They're doing what they need to do to invest in the services that they need to 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 write the ship. They're both brands, and you you know you especially are an expert at managing brands. You got any suggestions for either one of them as a brand manager as to how to weather the disruption and the maybe concern about stability? Just from a, a financial standpoint, I was looking down. Um, Facebook lost about 2% again today, yeah. but Twitter took another 8% hit, and, and Facebook's got a lot of, a lot of uh, heft to it. Twitter's down uh, you know, almost, almost a, a third in just the past week. Mm -hmm. As a brand manager, what would your suggestion be? Spread the wealth. Yeah. Don't just focus all your energies just on Facebook and the social channels. Really look at your brand holistically and where you want to be in the marketplace, looking at your competition and really what you want to stand for because that's what's so important in this day and age is who do you want to be when you grow up and what do you want the people to really, like the public to really look at you as. So not just leveraging your social channels. I Obviously, ideally important and you, and you need them, but looking at the larger picture. Um, any other suggestions to brands in this? You know, it, is there a good way besides hiring you guys, but in the, it, to, yeah, <laughs> to do sort of a brand assessment. What's, you know, how to look at themselves with some level of uh, analysis and where they should, how they can uh, assess the strengths and weaknesses of their brand? Yeah, with every, with every client, we do a research and analysis phase as the very first step that we take before we even dive into you are, what you should look like, what should your brand color palette be, your brand book, <laughs> is really understanding what are people saying about your brand. Right. I mean, you can do that yourself. You can, you know, take it to the street, asking those questions, um, talking to other consumers, really understanding what your what the brand perception is out there, then taking that feedback and molding yourself into where you need to be. Great. Um, as always, we Thanks appreciate you. you coming on. Congratulations on all the success of Thanks. the uh, Blockchain Summit. Thank I you think for it, coming. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, we had, I was there, and we had reporters over there, and we had all sorts of folks. Then we had folks back here, and uh, I think we probably got five or six stories up on yeah. a range, and, and all the Providence media did. I know Steve went over and interviewed with 10, and uh, some of the other folks and yeah, there was a lot of coverage. Yeah, there was a lot of coverage. Stephen, David, there was a lot yeah. of press around. Yeah, and uh, I think it was, you know, I, I said to somebody, it's kind of the way Rhode Island used to work. Instead of everybody being divided and partisan, it kind of was. It was refreshing. It right? was absolutely refreshing that kind of everybody in media, government, business, kind of came together for a couple of days, saw the opportunity to put on Rhode Island's best face, and joined together and. You know, who knows what it will lead to, but it has the potential to be very, very significant. Uh, any one or multiples of those companies could potentially relocate here or create uh, entities, business entities here. And it is, it is an industry that, whether anybody likes it or not, is going to transform business in a lot of different ways and a lot of different structures. And it's going to be very disruptive. In a uh, positive way. In some cases, positive, and in some cases, it's going to obliterate uh, the past and some of the structures of the past and how things uh, uh, are are managed now. So I think it it's going to be a very exciting. And there's, you know, as we've all learned in in all of these things, taxi drivers aren't going to stop Uber, um, and uh, and. Uh, we're not going to stop blockchain. And nobody's going to stop <laughs> blockchain or these scooters that are going by on a regular basis. <laughs> the only thing that's going to stop them is a curbstone. Um, so uh, thanks, as thanks. always, for coming on Business Monday. We're going to be right back in a second with Saul Kaplan, the chief catalyst over at Business Innovation Factory. We're going to be talking uh, media 
and uh, as well as merger mania here in Rhode Island. We'll be right back. Joe, ready when you are. We're back, Business Monday. We are here with Mr. Innovation, Saul Kaplan from Business Innovation Factory. Uh, it has been a crazy week since you were here Monday. We, we dared to talk about uh, 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 the merger of Twin River with the, uh, the, the Delaware Gaming Company, which is going to allow Twin River to uh, go public. They're going right. to leverage that right. business shell. But then... <laughs> Uh, we saw two more uh, acquisitions. We saw uh, the acquisition of Super Value, yeah. and uh, that's over by your neck of the woods. By yeah, uh, and then um, Angus's Davis Place over at Upserve made an acquisition as yeah. well. Is uh, is this luck of the Irish that all three companies were the acquirers? Uh, or is there something deeper to be said and a, and a good sign for the Rhode Island economy that this is a business hub that has got some uh, uh, emerging girth to it? Well, better to be the acquirer than the acquiree. Uh, and so it's nice to see you know, some of the local teams uh, making some acquisitions. Um, look, you've got to move today. You cannot stand still. Uh, and so what's the first thing that most... Uh, CEOs do is they try to acquire something. Right. It's much easier to buy something uh, than it is to change the core organization. Right. So uh, let's uh, let's wait on changing the core organization and see if we can't buy something, and maybe that will take care of things. In this case, three different situations. Mm -hmm. um, you know, happy to, to take each one. The UNFI, the United Natural Foods ones, uh, is, uh, I follow this closely. I always have. Uh, when I was economic development director here, uh, we attracted them to from Connecticut. Rhode Island from Connecticut. Uh, and they put their headquarters here. Uh, they put it out on uh, Valley Street where uh, we had moved the economic development offices and they continue to grow and expand. And that uh, site is uh, is pretty full right yeah. now. Uh, we were the first tenants. Uh, in I remember. So, so really nice to catalyze a part of the city uh, that uh, it's fun to watch. But it, it, UNFI uh, is in a situation where uh, 33% of their business is uh, a distributor to Whole Foods. Right. Right. So when Amazon buys Whole Foods, uh, all of a sudden you can imagine uh, what's going on in the executive suite over at uh, UNFI. So we, right? we've seen two of the biggest mergers yep. of two public companies in Rhode Island, CVS buying Aetna, UNFI yep. buying Super Correct. Value. Big, big deals, obviously, the CVS Aetna yep. deal being one of the biggest right. deals in in U.S. merger history, uh, but UNFI buying super value, a multi-billion dollar deal. Right. Both deals, deals sparked with a legacy of reacting to Amazon. 
Uh, um, oh, that's interesting. I mean, yeah, well, I don't think it's, it, Amazon certainly is having that kind of impact in the market broadly, uh, but it's not just Amazon. It's the disruption that's happening all around us, uh, and if you're not playing offense, uh, you can't win playing defense. Right. You can't win just by hunkering down and protecting you know, what you have. So those are two examples of how can we become more captains of our own destiny here. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, so that's certainly true in CVS's case. How do I change the conversation? How do I do something that's strategic, that can be market making, not just share taking? And as we've talked before, acquiring the same kind of company just to get bigger scale, you're gonna see more of those deals, right? But those deals are starting to get harder to do. Mm -hmm. At some point, it can't just be scaling what you already do. It has to be getting access to, to new capabilities that allow you to change what you deliver to your customers. Right? So in the case of UNFI, they really are getting bigger. It's, it's really uh, them adding capacity in the wholesale market. I'm pretty sure they're going to uh, dump the retail part of super value. Right? 80% of it is wholesale wholesale distribution, which is UNFI's core business. Mm -hmm. They've got some 5,000 private label products. They've got lots of new customers that they can add, and it, it decreases the percentage of UNFI's total that's sitting in the basket uh, of Whole Foods. Do now, they lose Whole Foods business? Do well, they lose not, that? Well, first of all, that deal goes to 2025, so it's mm -hmm. not like they're facing a cliff tomorrow, yeah. but 2025 will be here soon enough. Right. And so if you have a third of your business wrapped up with someone uh, through the end of 2025 who has the potential to change their wholesale distribution play or take it in-house, which you know, Amazon's been known to do, um, you, you want to expand and diversify. So it seems like it's a smart move. The question really is, in, a, in the end, you know, is the wholesale distribution business in food retail, right? Is that a growth business? Is that a high value business when you have Amazon disrupting the way we get at our groceries, as we've talked uh, yeah. many times uh, on this show? It, in the, on the surface, it seems like a good move. Leave aside what they paid for it. I mean, the shareholders of Super Value sure liked it. Yep. Uh, not so much on the UNFI side, right. although I think that's settled out uh, a little bit here. Uh, and again, it's a Rhode Island headquartered company. We should be paying a lot of attention to this, right? Uh, well, there's a big right? deal. They yep. employ a lot of folks here. Yep. Uh, they've been at some level of, of reported risk after Amazon bought Whole Foods, that there was concern that this right. was a bit of a disruptor yep. for them. They're the acquirer. Uh, it's a significant number of employees. Do right. they become more, uh, w whether they shed the retail locations or not, do they become more of a consumer brand? Do they start to build their own brand? Well, they, be, they get a bigger national uh, footprint, yeah. right? They get operating strength and scale. Right. There's some, uh, that deal uh, had, I don't, I, I thought I saw $180 million of quote unquote synergies, yeah. which basically means you're getting new customers and you're cutting the cost to serve them because you're leveraging I think that's called it. layoffs. Yeah. I think whenever you see in the uh, merger document, <laughs> Hence the, the word quote unquote synergies. Synergies, that yeah. means a whole bunch of people right. on the back end get uh, chopped. But that's how you pay for these deals. <laughs> yes. You pay for these deals because all the headquarters jobs, a lot of the infrastructure and system kinds of jobs, right? Uh, you don't need all of that. It's redundant, right? Right, And so that you can serve more customers off of a lower cost base. And that's why these acquisitions look so attractive because you immediately take those synergies right, yep. you know, out uh, and now you're running a more profitable business with upside growth. The problem is how long can you keep doing that? How big can you get, right, until, uh, until you've run out of opportunities to scale, and then you need to look for other strategic businesses to be in, or you get disrupted. So right? just to go back to this, listen, Amazon has made acquisitions like Whole Foods, but yep. Amazon is probably best known for innovation creation, testing, Correct. trial, error, trial, error. Correct. Um, d doesn't all these companies though, yes, they make the acquisition, the, the merger that goes through, they're able to realize some economies of scale, but at the end of the day, don't all companies need to start becoming innovators? Yeah, well, I do not believe 
that you can win, you can keep winning just by playing the scale and operating efficiency game. Right. Yes, you should do those, right? But in addition to that, you better be looking at how you add value to your customers and you better be experimenting with new ways to do it because in the end, yeah. right, because if you take, go back to the CVS, you know, Aetna opportunity, yeah. right? They, bought all of the chain drugstores that they could reasonably buy. You know, they're at the margin of a strategy where you just acquire the same kind of chain drugstore business Absolutely. that you already have. Plus, the stock market's looking at you and saying, what are you going to do to use your leverage to transform healthcare, right, to start adding value and, you know, to the share price. And so the Aetna deal is the promise of we're going to innovate too. We're going to change the way we deliver customer value and so we'll see whether they realize it but it has the promise of doing it it changes the conversation amongst investors and then you have to be credible about being able then to you do, it. do it right, right. <laughs> now the question on you nfi is this is mostly a scale play yeah. they're still just as vulnerable to the disruption in, in, in supermarket you know in food retail uh, and what are they doing while at the same time managing scale and efficiency what are they doing to innovate I don't have insight into this but if you were uh, if you were coaching them or hoping that they got this right because you're a Rhode Islander and you want to see them continue to grow you would hope for a strategy that's both and I would scale generally. operating they better figure out a way to deliver me yep. blackberries via drone within 45 minutes of my order. Because at the ultimate, that's who they're competing against. Yep. They're competing against a group, uh, Amazon, that is yep. going to figure out how to deliver a carton of That's blackberries right. to right. my office within now, 45 minutes. It's no minutes. easy task because you know what the margins are in the wholesale distribution business. They work off razor thin margins. Right. They work off cash terms. Right. right? You know, so it's a finance play almost as, as much as if it's anything. It can be really good for stockholders right. if you can drive enough throughput. Right. The question then becomes where are the resources to be able to experiment with drone delivery? Right. right? Do you have the capital? Right. Can you raise money in the stock market? You know, or you can you add re debt to your balance sheet that will enable you to be making the investments in innovation and new ways to deliver value? This is a problem for everyone that's in the traditional distribution business. Right. Um, let's jump over. Uh, we talked about Twin River and that acquisition. It's flushed out a little bit more. It looks like, you know, potentially they could use that shell in acquiring oh. Dover to go on another buying spree of their own. Right. The gaming, in, uh, gaming industry is always in flux. Yeah. Every day it's in flux. Right. Uh, Harris Entertainment that I worked with uh, back in the day, I think has gone public, private, public, all in the last 10 years or yeah. so. Yeah. And uh, the game's uh, a high stakes, yep. excuse the puns, I can roll out about 10 of them, a high stakes game, and uh, it's going to continue. I said that last week. <laughs> yeah, you're using it. Oh, I can see. So you're yeah, now yeah. claiming ownership <laughs> of, of the pun. Cliche. Of the pun. <laughs> I don't think you can claim ownership of an overused cliche. <laughs> the, I like the move. You know, if you're looking at it through the lens of, of Twin River, I mean, I think from their perspective, you want to be less, uh, decrease your dependence on Rhode Island, right? You want to have assets uh, everywhere. You want access to capital, right? right? And I'm sure there's some early investors that want to take some chips off the table. <laughs> oh, Jesus. <laughs> so, so Stop the pain. Stop the pain. <laughs> so we'll see how, how that goes. I still haven't seen the details about who, uh, who how the capital is going to be used, right. you know, and, and if the capital is going to be used to continue to expand their scale, but just continue our conversation, not just scaling traditional bricks and mortar casinos, right. right, but getting into other aspects of that market that are related, but are innovations that require new technology, you know, online, you know, sports betting, you know, all of that starts to look like new markets, 
you know, for them. Absolutely. Leave aside your value judgment on gambling, you know, and its impact on society. I As started a pure, media company. Right. I've already uh, yeah. staked my game on, uh, <laughs> on gambling. Uh -huh. we, we know it's a good business. It's a better business if you have a monopoly. <laughs> Absolutely. Right? But then when you lose the monopoly, uh, all of a sudden competition comes around. That's Go right. figure. Uh, and how you deal with that competition is, A, through scale, the way Twin River's doing it. So you have a more balanced portfolio. Of, of geography and innovating by looking for new ways, right? Using technology, using online platforms. Uh, and you'd have to say, being able to source more capital in the public market is the smartest part of that deal, right? Without having to file registration for IPOs and all. Well, and if you're John process, Taylor right? and you just right. expanded Lincoln, then you just built a hotel in Lincoln. Now you're bought Newport, you know, you're expand building a, a facility in Tiverton, you right. would love to get out of financing brick and mortar for a while. Poor Foxwoods right. is, you know, uh, a vibrant business, but they've got so much debt from all the construction over the years that that's what's uh, no. holding them no. back. The scaling, so. it seems to me like scaling the bricks and mortar aspect of this, right, is is late in the game, right, and that it's it's not like we're going to put up physical casinos, you know, on right. every street corner. This thing is going to go digital, you know, that we're going to work through the regulatory piece because it's too attractive to municipalities. The tax, the revenue stream through taxing, you know, online gambling is too attractive. You know how dependent we, even we are in, in Rhode Island here. It's the third on, largest. Uh, on this revenue yeah. stream, you can bet we're going to be interested in ways to, con to protect that. Right. And it isn't going to be protected just by preventing other bricks and mortar casinos from being built. It's going to happen online. We need to make sure we're being proactive about doing it. I'd love for us to be less dependent on this industry sector, you know, for our state budget, right? I don't like what it means to have to, to, to have this kind of weight and this kind of dependency. Don't, 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 that don't, that don't complain too much. They'll be taxing innovation in a minute. Well, um, let's okay. jump over to blockchain. Um, ah, it yes. really, I, I'll, I'll say it. I said it uh, on uh, Thursday. It felt like Rhode Island a 30 years ago. Kind of everybody came together, private sector, public sector people, governor's office, commerce, yep. the media covered it. Yep. And everybody came together to kind of welcome in yep. 80, 100 of the more innovative guys around yep. the world yep. almost all guys um, yep. I, I uh, won't won't deny it is a male dominated industry they flew in from Israel Europe Asia uh, yep. across the country uh, some of these guys wildly accomplished uh, in as in finance and in uh, technology um, and uh, there's an opportunity here for Rhode Island to be maybe the home for this industry based on that meeting. Well, here's my question. Well, first of all, let me uh, let me say, you know, good for us for, for putting yeah. on the event, you know, uh, but then, you know me, I'm a cynic about this stuff. So uh, it felt like a media event to me, mm -hmm. right? Tell me what the substance of the conversation was. Yeah. Do, do the, all the politicians that were in the room saying, you know, we want to be the center for blockchain, if you actually ask them what blockchain is and why it's important to the community and what is it that Rhode Island brings to that conversation that's unique? Well, I mean, were there substantive answers yeah, there to were. those questions? There were. Right? And, and I ultimately, was it wasn't the Speaker of the House or Gina Raimondo. It was uh, Bev Dwyer, the banking regulator okay. it was Liz Tanner the head okay. of DBR they actually were the stars of the uh, week okay and that's actually who they wanted to talk to okay now, so, so now give I'll me a just, sense for now you're yep. a big you've yep. repeatedly uh, yep. spoken to the strengths of Gina Raimondo especially with business yep. leaders in yep. the country and yep. around the world she put on a, as good a show as one could put on she good. was excellent but what they ha had the opportunity to and I think greatly appreciated was that all day long and into the evening, those two top regulators weren't dismissing their roles, but were available to have conversation. It's about how we could build a regulatory structure okay. that would protect the consumer, the investor, 
but also give them the flexibility to be able well, to locate and run. This is the part of the conversation you know, that I'm anxious to have. Right. Right. I I've been following blockchain, you know, for a long time. I th you know, I understand the difference between underlying blockchain and cryptocurrencies or right. Bitcoin that sits on top of it. I do believe that lots of industries are going to be disrupted, right? Should blockchain continue to take off? What I want to talk about is what are those industries? How are they going to be disrupted and if you want to be the disruptor You're instead right. of the disrupted what are you going to do and then to make it site specific location specific now what i want to talk about is how does rhode island use its unique characteristics right to its unique size right to make it a place where companies and industries can accelerate the path to leveraging blockchain which is hugely disruptive to incumbents so it's easier to say than it is to do right. but if we could position ourselves as this is the place you come not just to talk about blockchain not just to talk about blockchain as like it's like it's any other technology right. blockchain is an enabling technology that could disrupt almost every industry right. if we want to be the home for it tell me how we're going to take examples of blockchain you want to talk about it in the financial services industry to disrupt banking you want to talk about it in the healthcare industry to disrupt medical and patient records, right? right? I'm, that is a fantastic innovation conversation. But let's get substantive about what does it mean to do that here in Rhode Island? Who's going to work through the issues, right, when the incumbents start to squawk because somebody came in here with a with a really innovative approach leveraging blockchain well, listen, that disrupts them? If we think right? uh, Uber disrupts taxi drivers, right. wait till wait blockchain to, disrupts correct healthcare right. record keeping right. and the thousands and thousands right. of now I believe employees. Rhode Island is a unique place for innovation at scale I think we should position ourselves as the place where we have the conditions to accelerate that right we know how to work through those issues so let me right? give you a media example there's okay. a series of discussions going on about the role of social media and that yep. users of Facebook should get paid right. okay okay and if you're a uh, advertiser and you're a wealth management firm you want to talk to wealthy yep. users of Facebook or other social media blockchain is that encrypted infrastructure that allows you to pull the data out of who's reading go local and then right. set a different pricing structure right. for people who want to buy cars and and the data right. analysis all of a sudden goes from a level of here which was way above right. billboards, newspapers, TV, and radio. Yep. Digital has got an advantage because it's got more data. And to a new level in which there's so much information and that trust is brought back yep. into de facto technology. So you could take, you could write an article. Yeah. It could ride on a blockchain enabled you know, channel. Yeah. And you could see the pedigree. You could see who Absolutely. read it. Absolutely. It, in a transparent way. Absolutely. We could all see who mm -hmm. read that article, who left that comment on the bottom right. of the page, right? And so you, as an entrepreneur, right, you could put that in place. Absolutely. Right? Now, when you say, what, when, you go, when you point at Facebook, you don't get to decide other than your boost vote on micro whether... Boost and micro-target. Right, you can boost and micro-target. Zuckerberg could do this yeah. if he chose to. What I don't but think he, may he not will want to. Right. You as an entrepreneur <laughs> could build a different model and innovate and change the way we get at media and see who's reading respond to it. Absolutely. You could establish that here in Rhode Island right. and then you if it worked, you could be off to the races around the country to do it. Mm -hmm. That's what I mean by make Rhode Island a unique place to help businesses use new technologies like blockchain right. to demonstrate a different way to deliver value that will disrupt the incumbents that move too slow. And we should be the place where we move faster, right? right? The problem is, I say that, but then the minute you do that, all the existing meeting players here scream bloody murder because, and try to get regulations passed to stop you from doing it. That's true well, in every industry. Well, I right? think that's true in banking, be harder in media, might be harder in medical records. Right. 
I mean, there would be different regulatory schemes to be able to do so. Right. I think what uh, this industry, and by the way, these aren't small players anymore. These are multi-billion oh, dollars. Oh, no, it's big capital the, the, being invested in this right now. Huge capital. Right. And you're seeing old school players like IBM right. really reposition their company right. to be a blockchain technology provider and consultant. That's correct. So, you know, it, that's correct. It, it, there's all it, kinds of help out there for you to do it. <laughs> there's all <laughs> kinds of help to make there's it all happen. Kinds of help. And many of the biggest players, right. many of the players, I won't say right. many of the biggest players were here in Providence. But it's not last week. it's not good enough to just say bring your technology Absolutely. companies here. We have lots of people that know tech, right? right? We have people, people who actually know blockchain do, in, in Rhode Island well, I think that you could that, hire? That nobody does right? because it's so fast moving. What so, I think they're so from, attracted to is a bunch of kids out of URI, a bunch of kids out of computer science, out of right. Brown, et cetera, who right now pack up and leave when they graduate. 70% okay. of college graduates out of Rhode right. Island pack up and go somewhere else. Second worst DMA in the country okay. that you might be able to then create a business infrastructure okay. to be able to retain those I do uh, think, young grads. I do think you could get an, uh, a start on this, but here's what it would take. Right. Let's educate people, Go get all 11 colleges and universities to do their part to create very focused programs in blockchain Absolutely. and their uses. And, that, right? and you made right. the argument on the bid for uh, Amazon HQ2 that the one differentiating right. smart That's element right. of the state's bid was that we might actually move in that direction. To actually move a workforce you know, forward, out skate out ahead of the puck. So if blockchain is something that we want to bet in, don't, don't give me the, yeah, you know, like right. we're, a we're a center for tech. Right. Right? Give me a, what, what are we going to do in Rhode Island to attract capital, to, to train people, to be able to accelerate the path to using blockchain to change industries, right? If you could do that, if we could position Rhode Island as that laboratory, everybody in the world would be watching us, right? But just standing there and saying we're going to be a center for tech right. isn't granular enough, right? It isn't specific enough, well, and we're not going to win that way. Blockchain is attracting right? the smartest young men and women in the world. And uh, Stephen told the story from Alchemist about okay. building his currency, which is now one of the standard currencies yep. in cyber, yep. and that one of his uh, technologists was a young man who could write code as fast as he could type. Yep. One night they were working a late night session. He said, what are you reading while you are coding? He said, oh, I'm teaching myself Mandarin. So while he was simultaneously coding, he was teaching himself Mandarin. That is a level of brain function that I do not hold. <laughs> Uh, ho 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 hopefully the young men and women who are graduating from the University you of Rhode both. Island PC. Now there's a lot of smart, a lot of brain power, a lot of capital going to not just blockchain, right. but a small number of emerging technologies. But if you want to differentiate like our place, figure out how to leverage those emerging ch technologies to change what's happening in our community and be a first mover, not on the technology itself, because guess what? The technology isn't the limiting factor anymore. They're emerging already. We c you can do this today. Right. This isn't 10 years from now. You can do it today, but we don't do it because it requires us to change our organizations, the way we think of our industry, the way we serve our customers, right? If I could use blockchain to create, let's talk education, right. if I could create a learning record that, tra that moves across institutions, you ever try to go back and get your transcript you know, from a university? No, you, that's why you, I have multiple degrees. I, it, you, you, I just start all over again. You just make them up. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. But, but you don't own it. The university does. Yeah, right. If we actually flipped that and said, you own it, and it was on blockchain, and you brought it wherever you went, and you could show people, here's what you, you learned and what you know how to do to make you more relevant in the workforce, that is a complete flip from the way the universities work today. Absolutely. Right? And so now the question is, if we were the first place to do it, if all 11 colleges and universities here in Rhode Island said, we're going to use blockchain, we're going to make it transparent, everybody who takes a course, you know, it's going to get added to that blockchain, and guess who owns it? Right? The people who actually went and took the course own it, not the institution. Right. 
we would free up talent that would become more relevant here locally. We would free up this idea that a learning record should be about the learner. A healthcare record should be about the patient, right? right? And blockchain can enable all of that, right? And we should be the first place where it happens. You can tell I've been really excited about this, right? But uh, we got to go a lot further Absolutely. than a meeting where people get all excited about it at a high level. Hey, listen, right? most of the time we have the meeting about 10 years after the in industry. Is <laughs> so mature. you're right. So it's a good thing. So we're on the cutting edge that we actually have the meeting. Well, it was kind of fun that it was uh, happening here. It yeah. was absolutely yeah, that happening was, that here. That was kind of fun. I agree. Uh, um, uh, <laughs> let's jump over to the single most important issue facing the American economy, the <laughs> BIF Summit yeah, there coming you go. up in September. Oh, my goodness. Uh, there will be half of the uh, political world will be unemployed by then because of the primaries. We only so knew which half. So yeah. they'll all be looking <laughs> to <laughs> attend. We only knew which half. Uh, so l yeah. let's talk a little bit about uh, yeah. who's who's uh, coming. Oh my goodness! It's, 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 if you go onto the site now uh, on the Business Innovation Factory website and you go to the summit page, you know you can see now this storyteller lineup is all coming together. You know, Has it been a, finalized? I, I, are we down? Uh, have we finalized the last? Storytelling. We are in th we are really close. We have all the uh, we, we have all the asks out. We're in final negotiations. You know, we're down to the last four or five. But uh, uh, we've uh, Tory has to stop me from asking people, right? Because we've got too many asks and not enough slots. But uh, today uh, we just have you heard back what? from uh, uh, Sean Spicer? Is, <laughs> is Sean Spicer going to be one of the storytellers? Because I've heard him called a storyteller, like claiming, you know. Yeah, he, he didn't make the innovation part. Though. That's the problem. Uh, we try. We, we don't. Uh, we've been at this so long, and we do such a great job of filling up that theater that we don't have to just go with name brand. Like we can get to the real uh, people that are transforming stuff. Uh, today, we just uh, finalized uh, Phil Shepard. Uh, I don't know if you saw him. We we wanted to bring him back. Uh, this guy is a world class cellist. He plays the acoustic cello. You know, London School of Music. He's part of the. Uh, Academy Motion Picture and Arts. Uh, he does all of the uh, movie sound scores. He's got some 60 scores. You know, he's won all kinds of Grammys. Uh, he just did the soundtrack for the latest uh, uh, PS, Sony PS PlayStation game. Oh, wow. Right, and it, uh, surprising to me, I didn't realize this because I'm not a gamer, right? But it turns out that the budgets to do the scores for these vi interactive video games is more than a big motion picture. He just did the one for uh, you know, Beyond Detroit. Mm -hmm. uh, uh, that just got released. He's coming back. He's going to play, share a story. He is so inspiring and compelling. I'm so glad the dates uh, worked out for him. But he's part of this uh, lineup this year. We're getting really excited because we're getting close. Right. Uh, and so uh, the we're about uh, five, to five, 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 six weeks away. It's uh, it's. I think it's more like eight weeks away. Uh, and the, we're going to sell out just like we do every year. Uh, the room's going to be filled with 500 innovation junkies. And the good news for Rhode Island uh, is that they, uh, people come from not, o not just all over the country, they come from all over the world, right, uh, to come to this thing. For those two days every year, right, the, to be here in Rhode Island, uh, everybody who comes here thinks we're the most innovative place on the planet, right? Because we're thinking about innovation in a human-centered way. People are openly sharing what they're working on, what they're struggling with, and how to get better faster. Uh, we look forward to it every day. Our team uh, gets so much out of just the inspiration from it, uh, and it's a great joy uh, for us to pull it together every year. It is always uh, one of the more inspiring events uh, in Rhode Island. Island, it's, uh, you know, you walk out of there, your brain is functioning at uh, record pace, uh, you know, they glow up, the lobes are all in uh, bright yeah. red, uh, and uh, it really is one of the more remarkable events if you haven't been to it. Uh, as always, thank you very much for joining us on, uh, on Business Monday. Uh, this segment on Business Monday is uh, brought to us by our friends over at Deepwater Wind, uh, one of the smarter innovation uh, guys. Uh, kicking around Rhode Island. Uh, that company is uh, in hyper growth as well, and it's good to see. Uh, we'll be back tomorrow afternoon. Uh, I think Rachel Noons has the 3 o'clock hour, and Kate Nagel's back at 4 o'clock. And if you haven't heard the news 
Go Local made some uh, major staff announcements today with uh, the addition of uh, five new folks uh, in different roles. So we're excited about that and excited about our growth. Thanks, everybody, for tuning in. Uh, see you back tomorrow.